Welcome back to another episode of the Magnus and Marcus podcast. I'm Steve Magnus and joined by John Marcus. John, how are you doing? Are you in a ranting mood? I'm doing well. Almost the end of 2016. Quite a year. I, Quite a year. Yeah, this, that's right, man. This could be our uh, our end of the year podcast. I didn't even think about that. It's been a, a year of craziness and multiple areas so take that for what what it may be yeah it'll be a memorable year i feel like we're like in the 70s you know with uh vietnam nixon black panthers uh eastern Bloc. uh yeah i mean you name it (laughs) i feel like this is our version of the 70s yeah we'll look back and uh hopefully hopefully we'll be here and looking back in 30 40 years and be like whoa that was a trip who would have thought? Who would have thought? It's, uh, you know, it's like you look back. I remember growing up, you look back at the 70s and stuff, and you're like, Mom, Dad, what, what in the heck were you doing? You guys were crazy. I feel like that's what kids will be looking back at us one day, being like, you guys were nuts. Oh, it just shows you how cyclical human nature and human civilizations are. I mean, at the end of the day, like <laughs> it really does. When you think about it, look at like the Roman Empire, look at um, Napoleon, um, look at the uh, Mayas and Aztecs. I mean, these were very sophisticated and, you know, the Egyptians, of course, um, and very elaborate societies that ended up crumbling for some way, shape or form, despite, you know, their best interests to not. And you know, I think that segues really well into what Steve and I and a lot of people inside the kind of track and field running world are always have top of mind is this eluding question on how to save the sport from this long, slow, painful death that's occurring into absolute uh, amenity. So. All right. So how do we do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Steve and I are talking offline, and you know, I, I think to your credit, and uh, you know, t- talking about what you know, and c- continuing what we were talking about before we started to press the record button is, y- 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 we just have to understand is the sport and life and human beings are all highly complex adaptive systems, and anytime you have a highly complex system, it's very difficult to project models into you know the far seen future and so yes you have to have a plan because you have to know where you are and you have to want to know where you want to go but at the same time too you have to be very resilient and ask yourself is the solution you have now something that could be viable years and years down the road it's like that's one of the things that makes america so great right is our constitution it's somewhat opaque um somewhat vague language but what's said is very clearly definable in a lot of ways that doesn't allow for a lot of wiggle room and which has, you know, kept this country alive and thriving for 250 plus years. And I mean, amazing foresight on those founding fathers, because what they essentially did when they, you know, left um, England is they said, look, all these things are not working. Let's make sure that whatever happens in the future we don't create a society that's going to allow the things that aren't working to infect what we have here and make that, you know, make us now more homogeneous and, a, you know, copycat of that society that we left. Granted, as we know, America, track and field, a lot of highly complex organisms. Not everything's perfect. There's a lot of, you know, underbellies and things that are, you know, just not awesome. But it It doesn't stop you from what I like to do, what I like to call um, doing the utopia um, thought experiment where you try to say, okay, if I had all the keys and I ask people this all the time, like, you know, if you had all the keys to the uh, companies, athletes, coaches, whatever, you know, if you were the one directing the ship, you were like commissioner of the sport, what would be your utopia? What would be perfect? What would make it so it's like, oh, this is great. Like I asked Phoebe Wright this the other day and she'd be like, well, I'd want, you know, butts in the stands. I would want primetime, the, you know, I want the meet to be on primetime in, uh, NBC or major television network. Uh, you know, no drug cheats in there. Uh, lots of um, uh, competitive athletes who are clean. 
Um, you know, and you know, I mean, her her list of demands is pretty simple, and it's just interesting to hear that from an athlete's perspective because you ask a coach that, or you ask an administrator that, you know, and you get a whole different, or you ask an agent that, and you get a whole different set of answers. So, you know, that's the thing. I think when you think about how to fix anything that's broken, is you have to look at well, if you do, if you present X Y Z solution, which might be awesome and great. What are A, B, C, or one, two, three possible um, challenges or problems or unplanned consequences that might pop up? And how do you deal with that? And how do you create a solution that will be able to mitigate those unplanned consequences to also afford, like the Constitution, opportunity for new um, solutions to be remedied in the here and now that apply to present day? Yeah, I I think a lot of it is that we lose sight of those unintended consequences. In track, I think we're very, very kind of reactionary in the sense that we wait until something happens before like mm-hmm. fixing it or before mm-hmm. addressing it instead of being having that foresight to get things done when, you know, when the time is there. So I, the example I like to use is, well, how did, how did WADA get started? Well, it was a reaction to some horrible 1990s drug scandals, right? So, okay, we're going to create this thing, reaction to this. And then, you know, 15 years later, we're dealing with the same problems, um, same kind of corruption, a WADA system that does not work because it's not separate, separate, like they have no power, right? And it's not separate from the individual um, sports governing bodies and countries and all that stuff. So there's too many pieces in the cog. So my point is like in that watershed moment where we said, okay, world anti-doping, we're going to create this organization that's going to change everything. Um, I'm not saying you have to have all the answers, but the foresight wasn't there to at least anticipate some of these major glaring problems that are now showing their head fully. And you see the same thing on the side of the, the governing bodies of sport, whether it's IAAF or FIFA or whatever, it's that corruption without systems in place to, you know, almost create that constitution like effect where it's like, all right, we're going to anticipate some of this bad stuff that's going to happen. So let's get it done. So I think, you know, from a, fan coach athlete standpoint is that there's just not as much of like a vision of how things should be done and then um a thorough thought through idea and plan of like what could happen if this goes wrong yeah i think the difficulty is you know a lot of times we get caught up in trying to appease our immediate constituencies And who are in the here and now. And it's like, great, you know, this is a flaming pile of crap. And I like this flaming pile of crap, you know, and we've invested in this flaming pile of crap, so we can't change it. But it's like, guys, it's still a flaming pile of crap. Like, we need to just change it. We just need you just, yeah, okay, we're going to lose some of its luster and allure that you've come to like about it. But at the same time, too, you know, you need to make something that's going to be dynamic and sustainable and also redefine a category, you know, moving forward. You know, I like to tell people like, like, oh, how do we get people in the seat? How do we get people in the seats? Because everyone's so immersed in this idea, you need people in the seats. And, you know, that's how you're going to generate revenue is through fan, you know, fan engagement by ticket sales. That is a revenue stream. One, yes, this is true. But there are multiple other ways to generate that revenue. And one of the best case studies that I can think of in sport is actually the NBA. In the early 80s, late 70s, NBA basketball was, you know, at a crossroads. I mean, they believed like 80 to 90 percent of the players did cocaine, you know, and (laughs) everyone saw it as a cocaine league. Like, why do I want to watch drug heads? Sound familiar? Why do I want to watch drug heads compete in a game that doesn't mean anything? And then two... It was on tape delay. Like you, 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 you couldn't watch the NBA Finals in real time. You had to stay up to like 1 a.m. in the morning on a tape delay to watch the NBA Finals. When you're nightly news, why have already reported the score? So you had to not do that. So they had a lot of different problems 
when like David Stern took office there. I mean, it was, it was, it, it was, you know, dire straits, but they figured out what really mattered and what they really were. And they said, okay, we're an entertainment league that our vehicle of entertainment is this sport called basketball. Now we can't entertain ourselves because us, you know, inter- you know, playing this game of basketball in empty stadiums does nothing to entertain, does nothing to drive revenue. So we need these fans. And at that time, they're like, okay, we're going to go. And, and what they did was they went on a very succinct, very focused, fan-based engagement marketing campaign for almost a decade to, tr- to get people to understand, like, this game is awesome. Like, the classic line is, I love this game. And that's, that was the thing. I love this game because it's exciting, it's engaging, it's fun, it's energetic. You know, this is awesome. The other thing I'll also point to to basketball as well is this wasn't the first time the NBA or basketball had kind of a, um, you know, uh, dire straits moment. Actually, it was much earlier they overcame their first one, which was before in the early 40s and early 50s where the league was often deemed too slow and boring, where there's no shot clock. Remember, there wasn't a 24-second shot clock. So you could basically score a bucket and then hold on to the ball for the rest of the game, and, <laughs> and you could win 2-0. That, and that happened. Like, low scores, like 8 to 12. Like, that's not exciting to watch for an hour or two hours. So the league was like, oh, we need to make this thing more engaging and more lively so people will be entertained a little bit. And lo and behold, they created the 24-second shot clock. And that policy mandated that scoring, high-scoring games is the wave of the future. This is how we're going to entertain and energize our fan base. And this is how we're going to um, you know, sustain as an organization and create this, this industry and showcase this story called basketball. And then the other like counter to this, which is fun, which is just like, you know, people being really intelligent and thinking differently. So you get this influx of this high scoring game where all of a sudden, you know, teams are scoring 70, 80, 90, hundred points without a three point line. And then what's the most dominant team in the league for like 12, 13 years, the Boston Celtics who were the defensive juggernauts who, who figured out how to play good defense in the 24 hour shot clock system. Cause it used to be just get the ball, throw it up, get the ball, throw it up, get the ball, throw it up and, you know, not milk the 24 hour shot clock. So, you know, then you, that's a whole nother, you know, maybe separate podcast is how to thrive within a uh, operation of new constraints. But, uh, you know, why aren't these, why aren't people thinking in those terms where it's like the NBA is a highly adaptive organization that time and time again saw itself on the verge of collapse, on the verge of, you know, just complete um, and utter irrelevancy. And yet they, 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 they storm back with a lot of resilience to make them into what they've become and are continuing to be, which is one of the most recognizable uh, entertainment leagues or sport entertainment um, companies in the whole world. Yeah, so those are some uh, great historical reference points because I think a lot of times people just think the other big sports and they think like, oh, they've always been successful. Um, so what's the point? Like they have since entertainment has come. But I think the one of the lessons I get from what the NBA went through is that they saw the value of their sport as entertainment. And... If you were to ask any track and field athlete, coach, whatever, if track was about entertainment, I'd venture to guess that most people say no, right? It's not. Our our sport at the professional level is built around athletes running fast, jumping far, throwing far, and it's not built around the entertainment of engaging fans and collecting fans to make sure that like they are an engaged enthusiastic population and i'm not sure what the answer is to um get it to that point but i think step one is like reframing the sport as entertainment first at least at the professional level where you're trying to make money because if by definition if you are competing in professional track 
Like your goal isn't necessarily to run fast. It's to be a professional and to win whatever championship or whatever it is on that professional level. And I think that. Well, your goal is to make money. That's yeah. what a professional yeah. does. Professional yeah. makes money. You yeah. can be semi pro or amateur in quote unquote professional track and you can run really fast. But if you don't have a contract that says, Hey, you get a $10,000 bonus if you run this time or you run this time at a race and you get a payday, you're not really pro. Right. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's very <laughs> true. It to you. But, but that's the part of the problem is like our sport isn't professional in that sense and let, therefore we do not see it as entertainment for fans so there's very little fans and there's very little stories there's very little connection and it's like it has to be entertainment and then you have to create connection with the fans with some sort of interesting story and there's all sorts of interesting stories out there individually on track athletes but they're never like told and they're never like taken advantage of People complain all the time about like, oh, the NBA or or NFL or whatever have you feels scripted. Well, that's part of that is, and you can argue with referees or whatever, but part of that is because those leagues are trying to create a narrative that is interesting, right? They're trying to create like, oh, the Patriots are the top team, but man, they, they're kind of like the evil empire. The Yankees mm-hmm. were the evil empire who had all the money and ev- all the good players and could buy talent and they were going up against the underdogs. Like those stories are there because it benefits the league to have those narratives that engage people. We have people who could be, I won't say names, we have evil empires, we have underdogs, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the foundations of, of good drama. You know, and that's that's what good sport is, is good drama. That's why the Olympic trials is very theatrical and very entertaining because it's good drama. People fall who are favorites and don't make a team. And then they bounce back in another event and make a team. If you're the world record holder and you didn't make a team, like, <laughs> I, I mean, that's awesome drama. So, and, and that gets me to, I think, the point at the college side and the professional side is that we lose sight of that. And it gets us to like, how do you qualify for national teams for most, most places, right? Well, maybe you have a trial selection race, but then only the winner is guaranteed. And then I'm going to have some guys in a room select you. Where is the drama in that, right? Where is the, where's the story in that? That's like having the NBA go, okay, like, so the winner of each, each conference, like they're guaranteed a playoff spot. But then, you know, we're going to sit around and we're going to decide who our other eight eight teams in each conference are that gets to go to the playoff. Like, that's not, that creates that drama of that last second, like, playoff push. Or, you know, hey, these guys lost in the first round, but, you know, they're really good. They're like the defending champions. So we're just going to use our selection and move them forward. And I think that's one of those points where it's whether professional side with the multiple countries who do that shady stuff and just, you know, take the drama out of their national championships. That's why very little people go and watch, I think, the, the British trials, right? It's right. Not, yeah. Not heavily attended. Um, even though they have some fabulous athletes and it's because a lot of their stars don't even compete because, Hey, I got the guaranteed selection. Well, they're shooting their sport in the foot. And I know they think, oh, well, you know, it helps them get better for the Olympics. But that that's like saying, hey, LeBron, take the regular season off so that you're ready for the championship. Would anybody, would more people watch the regular season if LeBron was, was gone and waiting? No. But that's what we do in our sport. And it's, right. just, it's, yeah. it's the same thing in the college system that they try and do is like contrive it. Or not to go on a rant about college, but new system in college cross country qualifying they're trying to push through based on algorithms to get to nationals instead of like a regional system or instead of a not only a regional system, but instead of a system where you can race to get there. Right. And I think it's like, well, okay, maybe we get the quote unquote better athletes there. Everybody gets there, but then there's like, 
you're taking away the the drama of competition. Yeah, but where, yeah, so where's the underdog? Where's the underdog narrative that's so exciting? You know, like, oh, you know, like, you know, <clears throat> this year, hey, the 12th ranked team in the nation for women wins by one point. That's kind of cool, regardless of who the team is, you know? Yeah. Like, that's something you can, that can pique someone's interest. You know, the, re- the reality is <clears throat> there's two things not happening, which is very disheartening. Is one, there's no um, outside in kind of, autopsy going on here it's all insulated and very insular thinking it's all just inside out hey we're on the inside let's think about how this is going to maybe be attractive to people on the outside what you need is to step back from the outside see the realities for what they are and where you're at and not what you think is of high value because we've devolved to this train all the time sport and that is the narrative training 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 look at this training look at that training I can't tell you how many social media platforms I see with very well-intended and enthusiastic and intelligent athletes and coaches or agents who are like, we did this training today. That's cool. (laughs) I mean, but it's not cool when everyone is doing it, when there's no differentiation. It ends up being this, this, you know, sea of sameness. Okay. And it's like, that is not how you tell a story. How you tell stories through competition. NBA plays two to three games a week. You know, college basketball plays two to three games a week. Football plays one game a week. There's this consistency to know and see a player on good days and bad days. But what happens is it's this train all the time, peak only at for the big one. So everyone thinks you're like perfect and you're always running at this high you know, world-class level constantly because that's the way that people get their paycheck is through hitting, making these teams or winning these championships. And, and and frankly, there's a devaluation that happens if you're not like at the highest pinnacle when you go out and race. I mean, for better or worse, it's like there should, there needs to be some consistency in racing and competing, you know, throughout the, you know, a defined season or two. And if it's like you don't compete for a month because oh, I'm in altitude for a month, I got to get that hypoxia benefit, 28 days, it's the magic number or else I don't get it. And it's like, well, time out here. Do you realize you've just taken yourself out of the spotlight or out of, the, out of competition and you've created an inability to tell a story? You basically put yourself on the injury reserve list for a month. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like – I, I don't understand how athletes and you know coaches don't understand that branding aspect or lack thereof. Well, is is detrimental to what they're doing, and sadly, it trickles down to the college level as well too. Where it's like, oh, we're we're not racing until Stanford. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to work for eight weeks, and then we'll race Stanford. And it's like, it's not really a race. It's a time trial, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's you lack the cohesive narrative. And I think that this is the – not that I want more power in one guy's hand, but if you think of it like this, it would be like if football – let's say college football said, hey, you know what? You have to have a set number of games, right, because that's what we have to have in cross country, like a set number of matches. Um, but you're going to just go figure them out yourself, and um, we're still going to have this conference championship game, and if you just do well at that one game, then you can go to the national championships, right? And then the college football coach goes, uh, okay, well, in that case, I'm going to schedule all these really easy teams, get ready for my one big game, and just knock it out of the park, and then go to the national championship game. That's, that's what we currently do in the college or the professional side Mm -hmm. and how how interesting would college football be not very interesting right people would be like oh this kind of sucks and you know what i don't know when you're racing and you know what if we play this game but you sit half of your starters then it doesn't really count so okay and the same thing happens on the professional side it's like all right, we have the Olympic Games, we have the Olympic trials. Those are going to be great. We know that. But then there's no cohesive season or plan or story that makes sense to get people there. Like, we have the Diamond League. Great. What is that? 
well, it's these meats that are normally really good. And then people are like, oh, so Usain Bolt is there. Well, maybe at one of them. And, right. you, you know, it doesn't, it makes zero sense. And it's like against my, my, you know, normal understanding to say, okay, like we need a commissioner to take charge and set these standards, but it's almost like what it needs because individually people just do whatever they want to do to get ready for the, their one or two big events and, um, control it so much that they know that their chance of running well at these select few events are really good so that all we ever see, like you said, is really good performances and we never see them struggle. Well, if we watch a football game, you know, every once in a while, Aaron Rodgers does horrible and he throws right. yeah. three, three picks in a game. And <laughs> and it's not like, oh, Aaron Rodgers is done. Like he should never be a quarterback again. But that's how we kind of treat it in our sport is like, oh, you can't have one bad race. You can't show you're human. So we have to contrive it to make sure that you are always superhuman. And that's the saddest part of it all is it is a detriment to the athlete, especially the scholastic athlete, whether it's college and even now tricking down to high school. It's yeah. this mentality of like, oh, here's how the pros do it. Like if you're real serious, then you just train all the time and you only are race that are race your mandate that you have to run to be selected for this, you know, championship meet somewhere. And you lose the value of figuring out a you know, exploring the depth of who you are as a young athlete. And that's the whole purpose in my mind of sport is sport is a teacher. It's a vehicle to teach us about ourselves. It's a vehicle to teach us realities that I may invest a lot of my time, effort, and energy into something and think I'm doing it at a high level. And then I go to a race and I get 30th place and I am, whoa, not as good as I thought I was or not as well prepared as I had hoped. And then you have to recalibrate and reinvest and reengage and re-strategize your preparation and identify pitfalls and areas of opportunity, just how you're going to have to do in the real world. Where if, you know, you're working marketing, you're like, we have this campaign that we're going to put out to like sell this next widget. And then it's like completely falls through and the campaign doesn't work. The widget doesn't sell instead of being like, oh, well, you know, making up a list of excuses. It's like here Here's the ownership of where I came in. Here's where we lack, you know, the versatility or attractiveness in the product, so on and so forth. Or when you screw up with your spouse or when you, you know, aren't on time for some important event, like that's what sport is supposed to teach us. It's a safe vehicle for that. And when you, you know, when you limit these competitive opportunities, then all of a sudden what you get is this, uh, you know, was regression to this kind of sameness and then there's nothing different or exciting about a sameness if i'm watching the same sit and kick 1500 at you know usa outdoors or nca outdoors every year it's boring but nca outdoors like this year for the men's 800 freaking awesome why because a kid just went jim ryan status and or you know prefontaine or you know, Jerry Lindgren says, and just went hard from the gun and ran a, and ran a, you know, a collegiate record or same thing in the men's 15, like Isaac York's hard from the gun. Like that, that's, that's what makes it super exciting. But when you're just sitting here watching, all right, they're going to jog, you know, these guys, these NCAA guys are going to jog 75 seconds for three laps and then see who has the last is 400. Like, that's cool. Yes. You got the, you know, you you got the you won the championship, but you really didn't capture anyone's hearts or mind with that. And that's I think what you have to understand what you're doing at any level of anything is it's always you're trying to surprise and delight. It, it just comes down to basic rules of you know marketing and also just making a name for yourself. So you know and that's the sad you know reality of the world we live in because it wasn't like this you know you had this era of the lindgren's prefontaines jim ryan's where man they just went from the gun no pace or necessary we're just gonna go let's see who who has it i mean also two women's running same deal i mean there were many pioneer women who just went out hard from the first step and that was exciting that was what 
you know, that's where you saw, okay, what are the limits of the human condition and the human capacity? How fast can I run from the first step? Not, you know, as much to Stephen and I is dismayed, this scientific experiment of a very engineered sub to our marathon time trial effort that was announced earlier this week. And it's like, it's not exciting. <laughs> like, that's great. It's in a Petri dish. That's cool. I mean, but life doesn't happen in a Petri dish. It happens in reality. And that's what gets people pumped is when something unexpected happens in reality and that surprises and delights you. Yeah. You know, one of the most disappointing things about that little science experiment, man, is uh, for the betterment of the sport is we're missing out on perhaps the biggest or most anticipated battle that could have taken place in the marathon in Bekele versus Kipchoge. Mm -hmm. Like you are looking at two now legends of the sport who first battled as teenagers when Kipchoge was, you know, world championship and beat Bekele in the 5K, I think it was in 2003. And you're looking at, you know, a decade plus later and they're now on top of the marathon. Could you imagine those guys lining up at London and going head to head and duking it out? The like that could have been an epic race. But in, right. but instead, like we always do in track and running is we shoot ourselves in the foot and instead we have, you know, one racing somewhere, one doing this freakish time trial, you know, at, I don't know, on the Dead Sea with wind behind their back. Who knows? Um, and we're, 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 we've, we're a slave to this time instead of enjoying this competition, which, Man, just makes yeah. me depressed thinking about it. Well, you want Ali versus Frazier. Yeah, like you want exactly. that big heavyweight fight. Like let's see him go up head to head. Like that's exciting, you know. And that's that's what sports about that head to head matchup. You know, you can't. You look at any other sport, and that that's what's that's what's fun about. I mean, you know, we all had those rivals too, competing in high school and college, where it's like there's this head to head matchup. It's like. This team and that team are like, you know, inner city or inner league rivals or, man, you just didn't like this one guy from that one school and, you know, and he didn't like you and, or maybe you guys were good friends, but you just want to kick each other's butt every race. Like those head to head matchups got the most out of people. And that's, again, those are really critical things because those create a narrative. Those create some kind of history. It's like the Army versus Navy football game. It's always a big deal, no matter how bad the teams are. If they're both zero <laughs> wins for the whole year, it's still a really big deal because it's Army versus Navy, you know, because <laughs> there's this history behind it. Yeah. And you feel a part of that continuum if you are a, a player in that game. Even if it's like that's your only win for the whole season, it's still a big deal, you know, and that's. I think those are those those very emotional things we seem to discount in our sport for whatever reason, not just from a fan or marketing standpoint, but as well from a coach's standpoint. I mean, I can't tell you how many times now as a coach, I'm more concerned about the emotional and psychological preparedness and training that I subject, you know, athletes under my guidance to rather than the physical you know, technicalities of it. Are you doing your A skip perfect? <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. Like, you know, what's this j drill sequence that you need exactly to make this replicable, you know, um, recipe happen on the big day? While that, those things are nice fantasies that we, we love to believe. We love to believe we have this control over outcomes and we love to believe that we can prepare and control uh, you know, unplanned or unscripted outcomes. And sometimes you can, but most of the times you can't. And, but how do you like in our last podcast, you know, Vern talking about Ashton Eaton, you, you know, going into championship meets at less than 80% readiness for whatever reason, but the guy's just tough as nails psychologically and he can get it done, you know? And, and those, that's what makes endows you to a player or an athlete or a team is just that kind of aura and mystique they have about them. Like Cowboys were America's team, you know, in football. Like that's the rah rah, you know. Pittsburgh Steelers were like these bad boys or the Chicago Bears. Like they all had these personalities. And yet, you know, 
you're seeing too major league football get away from those personal personality narratives of those teams and their um you know seasons tell our their ticket sales and ratings are stagnating as well because it's just human nature you start to lose interest when there's no emotional storyline attached to it I mean, one of the key things I always tell people about this presidential election cycle, it just happened. There was a very visceral, emotional attachment to it. That's why no matter the result, you know, people were going to be emotionally exhilarated or afraid for their life, you know, afraid for the the, the good of the country, no matter who won or lost. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't care what side who you voted for, but because it was this hostile differentiation. And when you have a hostile differentiation, there's a line in the sand. And that is what sports about. Who's your team? This team or that? Not just like, oh, I'll just vote. I'll just cheer for whoever's winning or who's the best team. I don't have any loyalties. But that's what makes sports so fun is you got to pick it before the game begins who you're rooting for. And, you know, and that's why you play the game is to see who comes out on top regardless of the ranking. Yeah, I and mean, it's <laughs> – you know, I, I feel like we have those personalities, we have those dynamics, we have those dichotomies, those different teams, those different coaches, those different athletes, even different countries, Ethiopia versus Kenya, going back and forth. But they're never, ever taken advantage of, right? There's never, there's never played up. They're never, the narrative is never created to a degree that makes it engage an audience. Like I was, you're sitting here talking about Kipchoge versus, or I was Kipchoge versus Bekele. And to the diehard running fans, that's like a dream come true. But in order for our sport to progress, like that needs the, the hype, the knowledge of what these two have done and what this means and how it's Ali versus Frazier. That needs to be somehow told to the public. So it becomes an event, right? And I think that that marketability, that event, that vision of getting us there is severely lacking and probably our number one thing on that we need to do. And again, I come back to it as like the NBA, when they were reformatting, revitalizing, it was essentially, hey, we need to make these decisions to get our sport back on track. And... I'm not sure who that person is for us or if it will ever occur. Right. I mean, and that's, that's a difficult thing. Whose responsibility, you know, whose shoulders that responsibility lie. And it's not a governing bodies because, you know, that's an NCAA, a USATF. Those are governing bodies who have more geopolitical or national kind of corporate interests at heart for better or worse, and nor should it be. And I mean, it, like the NBA didn't, the, you know, depend on USA basketball to get them to where they are, or the MLS doesn't depend on US soccer, so, you know, or Premier League doesn't, you know, depend on FIFA. Like these are independent leagues who said, hey, we're going to get up and we're going to do this this way to create a palatable, entertaining package that people can um, get excited about and follow. And nor should it be any kind of corporate interest. Like it shouldn't be any shoe company. It shouldn't be any kind of like, you know, sponsor that does this either. I mean, you, you have these opportunities with these kind of loose leagues that are being created, you know, that are giving opportunities to athletes, which are much needed and very valuable with the American, you know, track league and the track town summer series thing. But that's exactly what it is. It's a thing. It's not, it's not a league because when you're in a league, you're mandated to be there competing for that team. And like say in international premier leagues in soccer, like, you know, guys or soccer players are mandated to play for their, you know, their team, their club, the premier league team over their national team at certain times. So it's like, no, we need you in league for premier league. So you're going to sit here and play here. Yeah. The Argentina and, federations team will have to do without you you know but then okay for the world cup we'll you can play on the national team and we'll 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 fill your role here so there's some type of symbiotic relationship there but there's prioritization here all we have is just the national team and that's how people make money is if they do or don't make a national team and that's a very dangerous 
space to be in because you're also you're teaching them the younger generations at the you know developing levels NCA or high school all that matters is if you make or don't make this state championship and now you know um, national championships they have going on and same thing in in cross country so it it sh- it shifts our conception about what the sport really is to kind of a highly outdated perception that not a lot of people can get. I mean, I still remember that one of the things that made me love this sport and got me involved and said, okay, I'm not going to be a soccer player, basketball player, was the 2000 Olympics men's 10K, you know, Gebeslasi versus Turgot. I mean, that was the most epic 10,000 meter race I ever watched. That thing was awesome. Yep. <laughs> I mean, yep. you know, if you haven't seen it, watch it again and again and again and again. It is, that's what Olympic sport was about. Or when Hishan Garouge lost the 15 to like uh, Noah Nagehi and, you yep. know, like here he is, like the, the, the you know, world record holder in the 15, he lost to like who? What Kenyan? I've never heard of this guy. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, that that's what makes sports so cool. To me, the 2000 Olympics was like the last really exciting track and field Olympics, <laughs> for better or worse. Because you had all the storylines and they were well publicized, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, just all these different underdogs or favorites uh, competing, going head to head. and Everything was well hyped and there was this drama. I mean, maybe it was just the Australian magic, but it was it was really cool. And that captured my imagination, you well, know, my high school years. And, and that's what we're missing. Like people are always like, oh, it's just track. Like it's not interesting. Well, <laughs> if you look at it, people always point to participation numbers. So if you look at track in high school, the participation numbers are off the co- off the chart right but, but 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 if you look at youth participation numbers in track and field so the next wave coming in now they're 10 yeah. percent down annually year in and year out yeah so i i because everyone points to high school which is you know easy but if you look at eighth grade and down participation is shrinking and that's the scariest thing that if you are not aware of that and prepared for that and you don't know that you 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 better start coming with a contingency plan ASAP. Well, there you go. There's the knowledge. But I think I think part of that is like, regardless of it's up down slightly there, is there's a large number of people who do track who then do not ever convert into fans, right? And I was reading an article the other day on NFL and how. Their prime target audience, better or worse, is youth because they know if they get people playing and then they can convert them to fans, they become lifelong fans. And in track, we have a horrible, absolutely horrible, despicable conversion rate. And I think that speaks to how the sport as a at a professional level is, is kind of handled and marketed. Like if you look at marketing 101, I mean, when I'm looking at book sales and, you know, ads or even like, you know, blog posts over to converted sales, I'm always looking at like, okay, what's my conversion rate? How many people clicked? How many people were on the site? How many people actually bought? And ours in track is absolutely hideous, despicable. And I think that right there, is the number one thing that we have to figure out. And it's the same thing with like running road races. Yes, the numbers are through the roof. Tons of people run, but the conversion rate is horrible. And I think it's because, uh, partly because of like the framing that we do of both track and youth in high school and then road running, what it is seen as, which is just like, Oh, come out and do this road race and get a little fit and be healthy and. It's not really a competition. It's more of like a party. Um, how we frame that versus how we frame professional sport, which is this weird, crazy amalgamation of, yeah, we had the Olympics, but then um, we have all this other stuff that has no coherent story. So, yeah, good luck. Well, it's what's the life cycle of a fan, right? I mean, and that's this is where sophisticated marketing tactics come into play. There was, you know, I linked – uh, pretty interesting and astute 1992, so 25 year old um, Harvard Business Review article of a very candid, actually, very candid interview with Phil Knight, um, just about kind of Nike's rise to that time and also, you know, 
hiccups because they had many hiccups as a company. And, you know, they started off as one thing, which is a running company, you know, geared towards runners, employed runners, and they knew runners, and they made running stuff. But then they realized, okay, we can't continue to grow exponentially with just marketing to track and field and runners. So they started to diversify their portfolio because they realized that market was slowing, but they didn't totally do away with that and with that market. But they created new categories for new life cycles of fans or consumers to be ever connected to their brand. And you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, your brand, your brand, your brand. And I'm like, what is a brand? A brand is a group of people or a group of, you know, entities aimed at promoting some kind of visceral, real emotion. And sometimes it's, you know, emotion to eat, drink, sleep comfortably, you know, all these kind of like, you know, in non-differential brands. Like, I mean, how many different detergents are there? And no one's like, oh, I'm brand loyal to this one detergent. Like, no, it's not, it's not that raw, you know? So, so it's not all are the same, but if an athlete is saying, oh, I'm trying to, you know, enhance my brand. Well, what that means is you then are discussing what's the life cycle of your customer. So what are you selling that you can track to your customer? And it's not a number of impressions or clicks or retweets on Twitter because unless you have a some type of contract that says I get X amount of dollars for every like or retweet, you don't you there's nothing to track there. So what it is is it's like this interesting is this, you know, this lack of you know intelligent awareness about what really we're trying to do and how to, you know enhance the sport because everyone wants butts in the seats and they think oh we'll just do how we did in the 1970s and put billboards up or put ads on buses and it's like that worked great before you had a thing called you know the internet (laughs) or when newspapers weren't you know bleeding um from the you know the arteries and going out of business left and right because no one's reading them anymore but that's the thing when markets shift is you have to be on that cutting edge and sadly because we had a lack of leadership from you know um our category of track and field for so long it was just we're we're now in this place where it's like oh lazy people who were very corrupt who had only their self-interest at heart were in charge and they did not any, they did nothing but take as many bribes as possible to live as lavish a lifestyle as they could. <laughs> and now here we are. Like the thing's a mess and everyone knows it's a mess and no one really but no one really wants to get up and say, Okay, I'll be the janitor here and I'll clean this up, guys. Who's with me? And that's what the sport really needs is that transformative leadership. And you hear about these newly elected leaders to different federations or whatever who have a vision. I have a vision. But the reality is the vision is get it on TV because if it's on TV, then that's where the perceived marketing dollars are at and the perceived revenue dollars are at because people will point to, hey, the Olympics brought in $2 billion in adver- advertisement revenue for NBC. So, you know, the model's not broken, you know, so why fix it? Well, life's good if you're NBC, but it's kind of like, did you see that no one showed up in the stadium to any Olympic events? Like, I mean, the the emperor has no clothes here, guys. You you can't price people out of experiencing the Olympics and then expect it to be okay. Like that that's just bad for business. It looks bad, and the reality is the same things happening in our sport. It's like what worked in the '80s is not what's going to work 30, 40 years later. You know, in the 21st century. <laughs> But but we still but we still believe it because no one no one is allowed to come to the table with a fresh idea because, you know, it's, it, you know, systemic of the baby boomer generation who just just won't get off the pot, like retire. Like, I get it. You guys have been doing it for a long time and I love you to death. But, you know, you got opportunities because your forebears retired at 60, at 55. Like they were done. They said, oh, hey, we'll open it up. And now it's like this next generation is sitting here twirling our thumbs because it's like, oh, I'll work till I'm 80. I'll work till I die. I guess that's fine. I like working. And, and there's a lot of value and there's a lot of, you know, it's like they say every elder is a library. And when one dies, like all those books are burned. Like so there's a lot of knowledge there too. So I'm not saying just go away. But <laughs> that, not at all. But that's the thing is you've got to be able to pass the torch. 
And if you're not passing the torch and just hoarding, 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 what's going to end up happening, the thing you hoard will have no value anymore. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's over. As like I was telling a friend who collects comic books, he's like, oh, I got this comic book. I got that comic book. It's worth this. It's worth that. I go, you do realize once you die or even before you die, your comic books are going to deteriorate in value because the next generation didn't grow up with comic books, so they don't get it. So there's no value to them. And so as your contemporaries start to perish, this thing that you have wedded so much value to, it's worth 2000 it's worth whatever, all of a sudden it becomes valueless because you only extract value if there's a buyer to, to consume what you're selling. Otherwise, it's completely worthless. And that's where we, you know, and that's the direction things are headed unless there is some type of intelligent thinking and saying, hmm, how do we make this thing amazing and awesome for the next generation? Not just like how we fix it for us so we can make money, but amazing and awesome for, you know, two generation cycles to come. Preach on. <laughs> go, let's go do it. Uh, um, no, but I, there's a lot of parallels in everything. So I'll I'll give you my brief parallel. So I've now published a book, self published. I've about to publish a book, traditional ways. And there's a lot of parallels in like the book publishing industry versus like the track and field industry and and what track athletes are doing and looking at only traditional ways and like oh like. Why are we doing this? Well, this is the way we've always marketed this, right? Let's put those billboards on, go TV, and TV's all that matters, and who cares? And, you know, in, in publishing my first book, like, I learned that made a lot of mistakes, but learned a heck of a lot about, like, new, how to newly engage people and market in the new, like, internet world, and how to make it work, and when going through the second book where we decided, all right, I'm gonna, we're gonna get a traditional publisher and all that good stuff. When pitching it, there are a couple times they're like, how did you, you know, how in the world did you make so much selling like a very niche, very technical book? And I said, well, there's, you just had to do these things. And I outlined through my like rough marketing plan, which was, you know, come up with after reading a couple books and scounging around on the internet and be like oh this must work this makes sense and and it's just like this is the new way to do it like y you have to go find your true fans and like make them engage them and get it done and it's not like i can just put an ad up and and get this done and you have to be extremely resourceful and they're like oh like that makes sense but we're still surprised and like to me Track and field is battling that, like, right now we have all these guys in charge and in there who are stuck in, like, the traditional publishing world and refusing to, like, open their eyes and see that there, that there's this whole new internet culture there that matters and that is going to put, you know, Borders Bookstore out of business. We're like Borders just sitting there like, oh, no, we're really good at selling books. We've always been really good at selling books and because we've sold books for a hundred years, like the fans are going to stick with us because we're the traditional way to do it. And people want to come to the store to buy books like people want to go watch track because, you know, that's what that's what we do. We're going to do it the same way. <laughs> And yep, I think like Blockbuster, like Circuit City, exactly. like Sports Authority. <laughs> it, exactly. Like that's what I feel like track is sitting there like. And I think athletes like they're, as you mentioned, like they're trying to get it. But I think there's this grave misunderstanding, as you pointed out, of what a brand is and what how you build one. And like every, well, every it's also who are the best coaches? Yeah. You know, who do we revere as like the best historical coaches, the most creative Yep. You know, Brother Calm in Kenya, soccer coach. All right, I'm this is what I got. This is what I got. Let's let's make it happen. You know, Tom Telez, you know, uh Percy Cuttery, like they they worked with what they had. That was it. And they somehow made it work because they were creative enough to be like, All right, we're gonna just explore, take some risks. We don't know what we're doing. There's no template because I can't adapt what this person's doing in this foreign place to what I'm doing here. But, you know, yet now we've just got to such this kind of 
it's, you know, I love how they call it. It's professional. Like everyone has to be homogeneous and professional and everyone has to be sameness. It's like 1984, <laughs> the book. <laughs> but how many times does like an apple come through and say, okay, we're going to do this radically different or what like say a, a culture like Nike was originally it was a rebellion thing. It was like, Oh good. We're getting ban- you know, sneakers banned by the NBA and fine. This is good. We're, 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 we are rebels, but now it's devolved to this. We got to fit in and right. when you have to fit in, you can't take risks. And, and exactly. It's, it's, it, it's uh, again, I'll go back to my first book. Like I had to figure out how to market it with a, with a budget of zero dollars because I had no money. So you get creative, right? And yeah. it's those constraints. It's when Tom Telez moved to Houston to take over, he had a dirt track. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> all right, how do I get this done? And it, you know, and it's like, oh, I'll figure it out. And it's those constraints that make you make us better. And it's, I feel like a lot of times, like what's happening is like the generation and track is like panicking and they're like, you see this at the college level. Oh man, we're our sports going downhill. What do we do? What do we get more interest? Oh, I know what we need to do. You know what were really popular in the 1960s? Oh, what? Those dual meets. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we love those, man. We get that way it was competition between two schools and everybody loved it and our school would come out and yeah, those were great. Let's go do that. We will okay, like I, I'm glad you're thinking of something new, but like, and I'm glad you know your history, but we can't just copy what happened in a very different culture and expect the same results. Like, if you want to do dual, it's great, but that format has to be updated and changed and evolved to a incredible degree to make it any any interesting. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same logic. If you get divorced at age seventy or sixty-five, you're like. Oh, I'm going to go back with my high school sweetheart because it was a good time back then. It was like, dude, she's married and moved on herself. Like <laughs> you can't, you can't replicate the past and it's, it's foolish to do so. You know, I mean, there's so many, so many historical uh, lessons that demonstrate that time and time again. Yeah. That's just crazy. Well, uh, we've been at this an hour and I have to go, uh, Go catch some uh, dinner and a meeting. So we'll yeah. uh, we'll call our our rant about the state of track and field in 2016, and here's to hoping that in 2017 the world comes to its senses in every aspect of life. And um, somehow, well, here's what before we sign off. Here's what I'd like to say. It's like sure. you know we talked about these decision makers who you know that everyone talks about. If you're listening to this, you are a decision maker. You, you decided go. to listen to this. You have some type of interest in this really specialized sport called track and field or in, in, and distance running. So you have some opportunity to make a change. And I think we can't just say, oh, it's up to the people at the top who make the big decision to get paid the big bucks to do this. Anything that's worth something has always been a movement of the people. You know, whether it's women's suffrage, the Civil War, you know, civil rights – you know, abortion laws, you name it. It's always started with the, you know, people who didn't have the many who didn't have quote unquote power. But that's the thing I think people forget is every day you have that choice. Do you, you know, play it safe and go through the motions and just exist? Or do you take a risk and try to make it a little bit better than you found it? And to me, that is what life is about that's what coaching is about that's what that's why it's there's a reason to get all hot and bothered about these things because at the end of the day yeah this is a very you know very niche sport it's fun we're passionate about it but you you know last thing i want to do is be the last generation that really gets to witness it in its glory before it just kind of you know trickles down to the the place where all these other sports are hang on for dear life that no one even knows exists like squash or this or that, which are great sports or, you know, wrestling proper or fencing. It's like, you know, you, you don't hear much about them because they're so, they're so fractioned. There's so few programs or opportunities to compete that exist. So, you know, that's before it's all, I, I don't like, you know, getting out there and be like, Oh, Oh, it's, you know, so the world's going South. All right. Just, get your plow land and you know hope for the best it's like <laughs> no somehow take some action like right hopefully what we've talked about is catalyze some thought and saying well okay how can i impact some 
community or grassroots change in my area to get my community excited about something I'm really passionate about. And you have even a morsel to like get 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people out engaged and excited about the sport of track in some way, shape, or form. Go do it. Because, yes, I mean, hats off to everyone who does it. Because I put on meets. I know. Like, I mean, I coach. I know. Like, it's tough. It's hard. And just when you think you've won, you've lost. Because <laughs> it's, it's always a shifting landscape. But it doesn't mean, you know, you have to stop fighting the fight. The worst thing to do is just not to say something and just let the status quo or whatever is being pushed go through if you don't agree with it. Like, raise a stink. That's important. You know, and that's – if anything, that's what this year has taught us in a lot of ways. It's like, you know, be a whistleblower, speak up, say this or say that because that's the thing that ultimately predicates the change. So because if you don't, if you just say, oh, I didn't vote. I didn't do this. I didn't. I didn't make a decision. I just just passively waited to see what the outcome is. Then you have no right to complain <laughs> about anything. <laughs> amen, amen, brother. It's just you know, make the decisions that you need to make and live the life that you need to live, and that's what it's all all about. So it's not about sitting on the sidelines. It's about trying to get the change um, that you think is right. So. Go get a change, and I, and um, you know the the marketing article I always point to is called "A Thousand True Fans" by Kevin Kelly, and he talks about the power of just getting a thousand people on board can change everything. So mm-hmm. I think that's that's how it is in track, and that's how it is in life. Is that we complain, we complain, we complain, but it's not that hard to get that many people on board and create a movement and get things going. That's how everything starts. So hopefully. Yeah. 2017, the movement develops. Yes. Power to the community organizers. There we go. 